Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Ryan Samuelson, and with me is Peter Fields. And these are going to be, this is going to be the, the first of hopefully several videos we're going to do where we're going to talk about the readings that we have for the 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 weird class that we are doing. That, that's right. Um, the weird, as Ryan Samuelson uh, will always remind us, in a way, simply means stories that first became popular in a periodical called Weird Tales. Uh, we're talking about the 20s and 30s, the 1920s and 1930s. And they, the, the cover of Weird Tales was often lurid, okay, and sensational and extravagant. But these stories proved to be similar and be influential. Many of them, many of their authors have been forgotten in the midst of time. It didn't take but a couple generations for us to forget who these people were. Lovecraft, H.P. Lovecraft, Our almost Philip. was one of those people who would be forgotten and consigned to a past that we associate with an obsolete magazine, Weird Tales. Um, he was, uh, a lot of his stories were republished in the 60s and 70s, and the baby boomer generation uh, uh, began to pick up these little paperback sword and sorcery stories and weird stories and things like that. And more importantly, modern writers have come back and embraced uh, Lovecraft stories. And we'll talk about that later toward the end of, of the class when we talk about the later readings and what's being called the new weird. Because right now we're in the middle of a renaissance, a return to to the weird stories to some extent. And, and this class is going to look at the original stories from 100 years ago, as well as the stories that were written in the last 20 years that were also embracing the weird. So what is the weird? Well, again, Peter mentioned the fact these are stories that appeared in uh, Weird Tales, a, a, a journal that was published in the 20s and 30s. Um, and there are certain traits. And um, Lovecraft and his other writers and the editors of Weird Tales we're looking for certain stories with certain traits, certain tropes, as we like to say, when we're talking about genre. Uh, for the most part, um, most people consider weird fiction a subcategory of horror. It is a type of horror. And it is a, an interesting type of horror because it is an existential horror. It tends to be one of the tropes of it. Now, what is existential horror? Existential horror is not necessarily the fear of vampires or zombies or things that go bump in the night. But it's a fear that everything you think is true is actually false, or things that you think is false are actually true. It is this it is a type of horror in the idea that your belief systems, your value systems are wrong, that there's something wrong with them. There are other tropes also associated with it. Uh, Peter loves to use the term cosmic alienage and the idea that um, the universe is far more vast and far more strange than we than we can think of than we can possibly understand or view. And a lot of this came about because of H.P. Lovecraft. The reason we're focused on H.P. Lovecraft is because his stories kind of set a template for what was now considered the weird genre. And he was also very influential with his peers at the time. And many of his stories and ideas were adapted by other writers at the time. And it became this sort of genre, this, this sort of uh, literary um, circle that would write stories all in the same sort of using the same tropes and the same ideas. It's the strangest thing in many ways. Today, H.P. Lovecraft is more popular than he ever was in his own life. He did have a dedicated circle of followers, people who, who admired him and respected him in that time, but he, he died poverty stricken. He he was obscure, and he would have been forgotten for a small host of reasons. But people like Neil Gaiman in fantasy, okay, and Stephen King in horror have made sure that we cannot forget about him. After all, they have pointed to him as an as perhaps the all important progenitor of what today. Uh, we take for granted as science fiction, fantasy, and horror, as you pointed out. Okay, the 
Uh, one reason Lovecraft might have been forgotten is that his writing style is quaint. It's a very elevated diction that relies on hyperbole. It telegraphs ahead of time that the author wants to frighten us. The author keeps saying over and over again how frightening the subject matter is. And that kind of extravagance, that kind of exaggeration, okay, we associate with Edgar Allan Poe. Edgar Allan Poe is one of the great prose stylists of the English language. And as an American author, would seem to cover that type of writing, would seem to best represent it. And again, Lovecraft, Okay, is somebody, okay, who belonged to a, a moment in time of early 20th century literature and popular culture that is all but forgotten. And what we want to examine in this course is, well, why not? Why is why has he not been forgotten? Why has he not been dismissed? We know that in his personal life, oh, let's face it, he was a mess. Okay. It, we we know a lot about his youth you know we know a lot about his family history as a person he wasn't very likable he was filled with prejudices that today we find appalling he belonged to an era of segregation for instance that saw that saw race okay, as a legitimate dividing thing, okay, that the races should be separate, okay, and that racial categories are significant categories. It's, un, it's unappealing at best, horrific at worst, and something we want, a realm of thinking and a type of thinking we're happy to consign to the dust heap of history. Again, another reason for Lovecraft to be forgotten. And yet again, the most important writers in science fiction, fantasy, and horror today simply won't let us forget about Lovecraft. So, okay, we're going to examine the weird. We're going to try and understand, well, what is it then that makes this type of writing important and significant for us today? And that is something important to think about because Many of the writers we're going to look at are female. Many of the writers we're going to look at are um, are people of color. The exact sort of people you think would not embrace Lovecraft, and yet to some extent they have. And why is that? Why? What is it about his writing of this very racist, uh, fascist uh, person that 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 attracts people you think would not be attracted to that style of writing at all? And hopefully that we're going to get to that when we talk a little bit about what we're going to call the old weird, the the, the stories that were published again uh, back in the 1900 years ago, and again what we were calling the new weird, the weird of stories that are being published uh, today, basically. But we're going to start Ryan, off. Okay, but Ryan points out. Ryan makes the all important point, and it's a good starting point, not just for understanding the first story we're discussing, the outsider, but ultimately. For, for understanding all the Lovecraft stories we're going to be looking at. And that is the terror is not of a werewolf or a transformational scenario we associate with vampires or any kind of familiar motif like that. Okay, The terror that Lovecraft specializes in is really far more intellectual. It's far deeper. We're frightened by piercing the veil of ignorance and learning that our common sense assumptions are completely false and inadequate to comprehend the enormous otherness of the universe. That's the nature of Lovecraft's project. That's the project of the weird, to challenge our ignorance. And so, again, Lovecraft perhaps should have been forgotten, almost was, for so many good reasons, but hasn't been because of the nature of the horror, the cosmic horror in the weird. And we start off with you guys reading a story called The Outsider. This is one of Lovecraft's earliest stories. 
He wrote it in 1921. So it's over 100 years old, this story. It wasn't published, I think, until 26, but it was written in 1921. And it again, as Peter has mentioned out, is very much in the style of a sort of a Edgar Allan Poe type story uh, where, where he... He says, well, I can't tell you how horrible it is because the horribleness is indescribable. <laughs> and anything, anything is better than the contemplation of the other. In fact, that's how the outsider begins. The, the speaker in the story is the disinterested Lovecraft narrator. He seems to be a, a person who who's entire experience and perception is irrelevant he doesn't seem to have any belonging he doesn't have any currency he's completely unknown and obscure and in the case of the narrator and the outsider he's somebody who doesn't have very good memories of growing up okay but he nevertheless clings to his memories he clings to his childhood, his childhood spent reading storybooks from the library of of this mansion. Perhaps his family one at one time had great wealth because certainly they have libraries replete with every conceivable book. And he grew up reading these books, savoring these stories, uh, connecting himself with the people in these stories and the illustrations in these stories. And he's saying that's not much of a childhood. That's not much to cling to, but it's so much better, says the narrator, than to contemplate in italics the other, to reach beyond the quaint and the commonplace, to reach beyond his childhood memories. Oh, that would mean touching and reaching out to the other. And we mustn't do that. We cannot handle that. That's the intuition of the outsider, the narrator in this story. Don't reach out. And yet, and yet the character, of course, is reaching out. And, and, and story-wise, it, it reminds me a little bit of the pit and the pendulum, a character trying to, to escape something, you know, trying to escape this fate that, that he has been given, this this position that he's been given in life. But already we see amid the commonality with Edgar Allan Poe, and this story feels so Poe-esque, okay, we also see the distinctive properties of the Lovecraftian weird. Yeah. And that is right there in the very first paragraph, ignorance is preferable to knowing ignorance is preferable to reaching out to that which is other which is ironic because psychologically lovecraft is suggesting that we naturally gravitate to the very thing which is so terrifying the other where we cannot help it we're doomed to know we're doomed to lose the safety of our ignorance Well, hopefully the people in this class have read the story and we don't have to go over every single part of the plot. But this is, again, one of those those horror twist stories like M. Night Shyamalan. There is there is a twist in the story, basically. And psychologically, there is something we accept along with Lovecraft that makes us that makes us forget and sets us up for the twists in the story. He says is so much better, isn't it? Don't you agree with me? To cling to the past rather than contemplate the truth. It's so much better. Don't you agree with me? The narrator says, and we do. And yet what does the narrator do? He recounts the story of somebody who doesn't want to just live with childhood memories. He decides to, he decides to leave, to climb out of this world, okay, where he has been protected from the truth. He begins a journey. And the first surprising thing that happens is he climbs and he climbs, going higher and higher. 
But when he emerges, he's ground level. He's in a cemetery. We're completely surprised by that. And eventually, he comes upon a mansion, which he believes may be the one that he grew up in because he, he sees memories and he remembers certain things. And he comes across basically what we assume is like a dinner party. And he steps into the room and everyone starts screaming about monsters. And he's like, where? Where is this monster? And then he spots the monster. Now, Lovecraft uh, does a very good job of making sure the ultimate twist in the story is revealed incrementally. For one thing, the outsider, the narrator, mentions that there's something terribly familiar about the mansion that he stumbles upon. There's something terribly familiar about the rooms in which he sees all these party goers celebrating. It seems familiar to him. It seems to be part of his world, but he cannot quite place it. And um, eventually, he catches a glimpse. He catches a glimpse of the monster that is terrifying all the party goers. The party goers are looking out the window and they're seeing a monster and they're terrified of it and they flee from it. And then he, he, the outsider, the narrator, he catches a glimpse of this monster too. And he has to agree, this monster is truly loathsome. It's unclean, it's uncanny, it's unwelcome, it's abnormal, okay? And it's detestable. Here we have the extravagant language of Edgar Allan Poe, but we also have that sense of otherness. There is this, there is this monster, and it has frightened away all the party goers, and it truly is something that is a leering, abhorrent travesty. And, of course, it should be terrifying, and everybody should run from it. But he doesn't run from it. He, he doesn't he doesn't know what to do, but he doesn't run from it. Instead, he reaches towards it. There's that irony. We accept both principles, don't we? Along with the Lovecraftian narrator, we accept that ignorance is better than knowledge. We accept that, okay? But we also accept that ignorance is temporary and it's fleeting and that even though we know we shouldn't reach out towards the other, this leering, abnormal abomination, we nevertheless reach towards the other. That cosmic difference, that cosmic alien thing, we nevertheless reach towards it. Our mind cannot help it. And he's reaching towards it. And to his horror, he touches the hand. Or he feels that he is touching the hand of this monster. This monster is also reaching towards him. And then, of course, and I apologize for the spoiler if you have not read the story yet. What he ultimately discovers is that he's tapping the glass of a mirror. This horrible abomination, this terrible otherness that he should have run away from, but instead he reaches towards is himself and that would seem to be the worst of all possible discoveries based on the agreement the narrator has with the reader <laughs> the narrator has already established common ground with us we like the narrator we cling to the past we cling to a what we consider a common sense model of the universe that we secretly suspect and know is false Yes, we cling to our ignorance, just like the narrator. We know we should not pursue or reach out to the other, but we did. And that would seem to be the most terrible thing to realize we are that other. But it's also, well, it's that empowerment we spoke of, isn't it? There's, there's a line in, in, the, in the second to last paragraph. But in the cosmos, there is a bomb as well as bitterness. Bomb meaning sucker there's a comfort there's something that heals bomb is healing it mitigates it makes things better and what is that bomb 
that bomb is belonging because the outsider doesn't belong, remember? And now he finds belonging. There are others like him and he belongs with them. Creatures of the night, creatures that haunt the darkness, the very creatures who frighten the party goers in the mansion, he belongs to them and he shares their world and he finds comfort in their company in belonging to them. And yet my new wildness and freedom, I almost welcome the bitterness of alienage. Boy, that's that's worth that's worth mentioning again. Okay. Okay. Normal life, the life of those people he saw in the illustrations of books, the books he read and savored growing up, he will never belong to those people. He will never belong to them. I know that light is not for me, save that of the moon over the rock tombs of Neb, nor any gaiety save the unnamed feast of Nyctocris beneath the great pyramid. It's those forbidden things, that for forbidden world, that forbidden fellowship. He belongs to them. He can never have the familiar world but he does belong to a larger world, a more dynamic world, okay? That world of, as he puts it, alienage, the cosmic other. And there's that unique property of the Lovecraftian weird. We're, we've gone beyond the prose stylings of, of Edgar Allan Poe's extravagant language. And we're now talking about something that's fundamentally philosophical, that we belong to that world that doesn't make sense. There's the revelation. We belong to that other. The world that we thought was true, that's not really our world. The world that comforted us in our ignorance, in our intellectual childhood, that's not really our world. We belong to the world of the cosmic other. And again, for 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 Lovecraft, that was the greatest expression of horror. But for people like you and me who have grown up in that type of world, it, it for some of us, it is the greatest expression of empowerment, of, of, of belonging. And on that note, we conclude our first video. <laughs>